First of all, I have never been between people and their drink. Oh, I've never spoken at this time. And never between people and their doggies. I would really love, want to be out there with the doggies as soon as possible. Um, and I have never presented in the outdoors in a perfect setting like this. So I think being between you and your drink and me getting to experience outdoors presenting, it's going to be OK. Uh, I have known Nicholas a long time. He kind of alluded to that. And it's been such a pleasure to connect with experts in the horticulture industry. And I've known Mark about the same amount of time, and as well many remarkable designers and landscape architects. And it's taken all of us to put this together to be at this point. Um, I am um, a registered horticultural therapist. I'm a horticulturalist because I have about 100 credit hours in college horticulture. I'm a mental health professional, and I'm an educator, so it just has made a perfect life. And now that I'm in the last quarter of my career, I just love coming and doing things like this, so I'd love to come back. <laughs> so these, uh, these are my objectives. Uh, we all have to work harder. When I took my college horticulture, and then I went into medicine, I thought, man, they don't sell horticulture very well. It's not very good marketing happening. I was just shocked. We do a better job of selling medicine than horticulture industry does of selling the power of what horticulture does for every person in the world. Uh, so I want us to leave here being able to share a message about how important horticulture and plants and nature are for everybody in the world's health and well-being. Uh, I also want us to leave knowing how well-designed gardens are places of four seasons of sensory stimulation, interest, great aesthetics, return on investment, and a whole bunch more. And I want you to leave with some strategies about how you can help make gardens more therapeutic, and the word is helpful, so that you can support well-being in health care, in residential settings, in parks, senior living, and literally everywhere in the world. So I told you already that I am a registered horticultural therapist, HTR, and the QMHP is a master's in psychology, which makes me a mental health professional. And I have a master's in education. And I, I don't have a horticulture degree, but I have 100 credit hours. And because I knew I needed to be pretty expert in horticulture, so when I could stand up to physicians and tell them what we needed to do, they believed me. So this is our mission at Legacy Health in Portland, Oregon. And I've been there since 1991. <laughs> First thing we take care of are our people. We have 14,000 employees. And if we take good care of them, they are in turn able to give better care to our patients. We also want to take good care of our communities in the areas we serve and literally our world. So in 2008, when our new CEO came, we did a new branding exercise, which is pretty common when a new leader comes. And we hired a firm from Chicago to do that. And these were some of the most important features in our system that they wanted to promote. I just fell over backwards when of the five things they wanted to talk about, one was healing gardens. So this would be the indoctrination for every employee that came forward. And then another one of the pages they used in this new training and new branding for our company was about our attributes and our personality. And they used all these pictures of our healing gardens. Now, this was in, 20, in 2008. And we really started our work in uh, 1991 at Legacy Health in, with gardens. And that's when I came. And I was so lucky this new super, or new, I want superintendent. That's from my teaching days. The new CEO uh, at Legacy in 2008 was Dr. Brown. The best boss I've ever had in my life, a retired Brigadier General, Army, uh, MD, gastro, a GI guy, gastroenterologist. Um, and he and I were interviewed for the Wall Street Journal. He says, well, what shall I say? And I said, well, Dr. Brown, you know what to say. And he did. And he talked about how the difference between legacy health and most other hospitals is that everybody seems to have pretty good landscape. But we have specialized gardens, and our patients are out in them as a part of their therapeutic program. 
uh, Dr. Brown, his last work day, 10 years, was last Friday. So now I haven't met the new person yet. We'll see how that goes. And I think it's going to go well. Uh, so I want to talk about why I do the work I do. And I do it because of uh, the need for public health emphasis in our communities. And I think horticulture is probably, horticulture, transportation, and how we build communities are probably the most important things for us to have a better world. Uh, look at heart disease. It is the number one killer right now. One in four deaths in America is because people have heart disease. And it's not just old people. People with heart disease die in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and more. Uh, nearly three quarters of a million heart attacks a year, which costs all of us $207 billion. And we all can have a part in making that better and decreasing those losses. Uh, there are 140,000 deaths from stroke every year, uh, 800,000 strokes. I work at the Rehabilitation Institute of Oregon as a therapist, and 60% of my patients have had strokes. Uh, they cost us $34 billion a year. This is adding up. And truly, people, we can't afford to keep doing this. We cannot afford this level of uh, health care around chronic conditions for people. We have to shift to prevention. And horticulture is going to help uh, environments that are positive and supportive and healthy with horticulture are going to help us make this shift. Uh, diabetes, 100 million people in America with diabetes now. Some of that's pre-diabetes, but it's still diabetes. $250 billion almost, and 80,000 deaths per year because of diabetes. And obesity, almost 80 million people living with obesity, costing us $190 billion a year. And that's 20% of what we spend on all medical care. Um, Four million deaths in 2015. So the answer is designing environments and creating a culture in our communities about active living. And we're the people to design those active living environments for children, Everybody needs to be out moving every day. Upright and moving is the new term. Upright and moving. And I was glad everybody got up. We never want to sit more than an hour. Active living for everyone, no matter where you live, no matter your zip code, no matter your income, your ethnicity, your race or religion. Fairness for everyone. So at Legacy Health, we work hard on employee wellness. And one of my partners is the medical director for employee health, Dr. Minot Cleveland. He was an emergency room physician, retired from that in 2017. Um, and we're working, and he's working in employee health now. We support active living, healthy eating, and peaceful mind for our employees. These two employees work in surgery. That's why they have those blue caps on so your hair doesn't fall into the incision and the, the equipment and tools and things. But they love coming out to the gardens to take a break. Uh, in our employee wellness, active living means we get people outside for their breaks. We want them to take breaks. So here's an OBGYN. I saw him in the morning, and I said, well, how's it going, doctor? And he says, oh, I just delivered two babies. And he was out in the children's garden fiddling around, getting a break. And we had this evening event, which is coming up August 22nd again, midnight in the garden. And uh, I said, how's it going, doctor? And he says, just did two more babies after supper. And now he's out have, enjoying the event with us. And we're serving fruit and healthy snacks. Oops. Um, here are some employees, and they're sitting, and they're getting off their feet because they've probably been standing for hours. Our nurses work 12-hour shifts. It's, very hard work. I was in teaching, and that was challenging hard work. But in medicine, I think it's even more challenging. And I really miss the two-week Christmas break and the other breaks I had. We don't have those in medicine. You work all, every day. Uh, but these employees are sitting, and they're signed up and waiting. I pay for massages, five-minute massages during these events. And they're waiting their turn to get a massage. So we really uh, research the evidence base about nature and health and why we are going to invest money 
And I have put together all of this in a five-page document, which you don't have in your packet, and I'll tell you in a minute where you're going to get that. But Kathy Wolf's work at the University of Washington, Green Cities, Good Health, look it up. It's our guiding light at Legacy. Another one that I just participated with the U.S. Forest Service, and we wrote a paper on urban nature for human health and well-being. And I'm going to tell you how to get, get that paper. Another one, I want, to, uh, I want you to know that science really informs all of the decision making in medicine and including in the therapeutic gardens. We don't make a decision unless we have some evidence to support that we're going to spend money on this. Um, and we did spend money on this study, and we have some other studies that we're going to be publishing results on. Roger Ulrich was the one Mark alluded to, that 1984 gallbladder surgery recovery study, where the patients looked out the window at deciduous trees and leaf, or the other patients on the other side of the building looked out at a brick wall. So we've been working with Roger Ulrich now for 15 years on different studies and projects. What yes? What happens when the deciduous trees drop their leaves for half a year? Was that like looking at a brick wall? I wonder. That could be another study. And I've also wondered, too, it would be great to have someone try to repeat his study and see if we got the same results. I would do evergreen trees, honestly. Could, could. Uh, but his, his work has informed so much of the next level of research that's been done. And we've done four studies, and this one is published. I will tell you one impact of this. We couldn't do the study the way we wrote it. We were going to do a double blind where half of the people would be assigned to stay in their room before they gave birth, and the other half would be, get to go out to the garden. 90% of the mothers said, I will not participate in that study if there's a chance that I would miss going out to the garden because that garden might help me have a healthier birth, birthing experience, and there just might be something that made it better for my baby too. So when 90% of the people said we won't participate, we changed it and did kind of a subjective objective study of the, uh, birth, the mom and their birth partners. And we got some good results there too. Another one, this study is a uh, study of 110 studies about nature. And I'll, here's how you're going to get this. When you go to my website, uh, on the professional page, I'm looking for a place to set that. On the professional page, you don't even need to worry about writing this down. Um, on the, pro the professional page is on the right-hand side, and then it says conferences that I've presented at. I just uploaded about 10 items for you, and they'll be available for you there. So you don't even have to write anything down. All right. Of all this, there are really more than a thousand studies done now about health and nature and plants and well-being. Truly, the research is all there. Good marketing departments just need to put it into a one-page sales pitch. And I guarantee you we're going to get better results. So these studies are telling us that plants increase physical activity and calmness. Several studies. But when I look at that suburb, I'm glad I don't live there because I think it's a very sick environment. But we do know how to do this. And this can promote people getting out and being more physically active so we can reduce that heart disease and that diabetes. These kind of neighborhoods promote calmness. Pardon me? Oh, this is in England. That's why we keep our English friends coming back. This is a hospital, and we have much research about plant, how plants increase concentration and pleasant feelings. When I look at this hospital, it doesn't help me feel pleasant, or it, I don't think it helps me concentrate. I look at it and go, what a barren place. This is the front door to one of our legacy hospitals. People come through a garden. So I think that, and people do comment that I feel better. I can kind of clear my mind if I come through this place. Other research shows how plants increase politeness in people. They say please and thank you, and they wait their turn. I feel like driving down the road with a garden <laughs> with these people that butt in and zip in and out. And ah. So anyhow, that environment doesn't look like a place where we could maybe feel very creative. And nor does that one. But these kinds of environments do help people 
behave more socially appropriately and politely, and people are more creative in nature environments. More studies show how plant boosts positive emotions and help us lower our stress. And that stress is related to cancer, it's related to heart disease and strokes. And look at if we designed front entrances to homes in a greener way, how we could have more positive emotions and help people lower their stress. So there's just lots of research, hundreds of studies now about how plants lower blood pressure, reduce mental fatigue, increase job satisfaction, increase our energy level, and even kids and college student academic performance and boost our immune system so we're healthier. And great plant environments cause us to get up and get moving and be more physically active. How many people belong to the American Society of Landscape Architects? Thank you. Uh, I get the dirt and I love the dirt. Anybody can get the dirt, uh, but focusing a whole lot on health and the health benefits of good nature. New York Times, the, uh, the press are covering this more. And there is this growing body of research about how people who they spend time outside in sunny and green and natural places like this, uh, we're happier, healthier than people who don't. There's even some studies right now that this obesity crisis, a good part of it is related to social connections. People who don't connect well with other people, so they stay in the house. And guess what they do? Eat more, anxiety more, uh, don't go outside, don't make friends, don't move, don't get active. So I love the promotional materials that Village Nurseries has. I like to go online and study them. And I hope we can all make it a goal to have plants every day, everywhere. And one thing we do at Legacy with these plant pollinators is in all of our gardens, we have do a number of educational programs around plant pollinators, and that's just one example. And we plant plant, plant pollinators, penstemon, and coreopsis, and bee balm. Uh, this is that intensive care unit garden where we did this, and it's family birth. They're right together. This is right in the medical unit on a second floor, and the moms, this is where they would come walking. I love the plant palette pages in the Village Nursery's website. The one I love camellias. I could use, we use camellias in every garden. And I want to show you, this is the hallway looking out at the children's garden at Legacy Emanuel. And here is that camellia setsugaka. And on the other window, I have, um, oh, the pink one. Pink, pink, pink. Let me go back here. Um, oh, fiddle. Anybody over 60 here and know how it is to forget things? <laughs> Anyhow, it's pink. Oh, apple blossom. I have apple blossom on the other window. People go nuts and they'll send me emails and say, aren't these things blooming too early? For us, it's October. So it just makes a delightful winter. So on the Village Nurseries website, I just get a, I use all these, these are ones that I use and, and many more. And I find these pages inspiring. And I use all of these conifers. And that Swain's Golden Cypress is amazing. I use that at home, too. And um, Juniperus chinensis, we call that Hollywood juniper in my neck of the wood. And I love that one, too. I don't have room for that at home. It's too big. But I have it in several gardens. So I look out at this room, and I go, oh, my gosh, these people there's so much opportunity in front of them. They have so much power because there are 6,500 registered hospitals in America. Wow. Uh, and I have to tell you, Legacy has more hospital gardens than any hospital in the world. Uh, so we're pretty special. We've been at it a long time, since 1991. We've invested about $7 million. Uh, and we're going to show you a little bit more about that. I've also worked in senior living, and I just went online and I checked out how many senior living facilities, and I found out there are between 28 and about 50,000, and it kind of depended if they were putting in those five-person homes, excuse me, for some seniors. And then nursing homes, 15,600, and that's, uh, there are 1.7 million licensed beds, all the parks environments, and many could be better. 
all the employment work settings, and not just the wealthy ones like Nike, all of the homes and all of the correctional facilities deserve gardens. Um, I just want you to remember therapeutic means helping and supporting. Those are the kind of words that I think you'll want to use in your promotion. And what's therapeutic and supportive needs to be related to people's physical needs. If they've had a stroke, how can they get out and get around in a garden when they can't use pull half of their body? How can they pull their wheelchair around in a place that is flat and accessible? Cognitive support, spiritual support. And spiritual means whatever faith or persuasion you have or don't have, you can find your personal meaning in these gardens. Uh, emotional support. Anxiety is raging these days. I am so surprised in the last 15 years how much anxiety people are dealing with. I mean, it's just absolutely shocking to me. And because I ha seem to have a really deep centering and my spiritualness happens to be nature and being in the peacefulness of nature. But that's not so for everyone. Uh, and then social connections. And I alluded that to a little bit about diabetes. Uh, some research has been done about people uh, not having good social connections and the health problems that causes. So we need to be looking at the needs of patients, visitors, and employees in hospitals. And I think everyone in every other place so here's what healthcare gardens are not. This truly was at a hospital in the Midwest. <laughs> oh, it's just, that is pathetic to me. Can you think of any other words? Oh, isn't that a waste of a piece of, it isn't even furniture? That's an art statement. Uh, Mark alluded to Dr. Ulrich's evidence-based garden design theory, and I'm going to show you where to find this. Chapter 2, I think you need to be pretty expert at. But we're looking at improved health outcomes when we provide places where people can have good social support, where they can have some privacy and escape from the hospital and feel like I'm in control a little bit, where they have more activity and therapy and exercise, and where they're out in nature. People need privacy and away from the medical unit. This is at our Legacy Mount Hood Hospital. The garden's right at the front door. This is the children's garden at a manual that's available to all adult patients and children. People sneak out in their hospital gown and their slipper socks. Uh, here's a grandma and the well sibling watering plants and we don't have anything that you could overwater. And here's a papa and his little daughter at the burn center. And I have to tell you, put the pans with the handle in on the stove. The biggest problem we have for children coming to the burn center is they pull the hot pan off the stove and get the hot liquid burns. Terrible. So here the papa and the little girl are watering. And here's a nurse taking his patient for a spin after supper in the garden at the burn center. So these gardens are all about emotional support that families can be together with their loved ones. And everybody needs movement and some mild exercise. And here's an occupational therapist taking his burn patient out for a walk. That's the first time this patient had been out and just moving, any movement helps the recovery. So stress and anxiety are all throughout our society and I think at higher levels than we have probably ever had before. But stress is always pervasive in healthcare settings because even if you go for a mammogram you're worried. Everybody's worried in hospitals. Even if you're going for a normal birth you're worried. Everybody's worried. So we focus our garden development and programming on patient-centered care, family-centered care, taking good care of our employees so they can restore and we want to focus on using the garden for pain management. And that evidence base, this is that book I was telling you about, Roger Ulrich's study that was gallbladder surgery recovery. Uh, that's in this book, Healing Gardens, and it's in the bibliography that's on our website for you. So chapter two, I think it's really essential. And this book is the evidence base, and Mark spoke to the Therapeutic Landscapes Network, and that's Naomi Sachs, 
and she's one of the two editors and authors on this book, Therapeutic Landscapes. And I wrote chapter five on the participatory process, and I think you'll want to read that one so that you can help lead the design team meetings, whether you're doing a nursing home or a skilled nursing or a hospital or a dementia unit garden. Uh, and then I also wrote chapter 16 on horticulture therapy and garden design. Um, the American Horticultural Therapy Association, I hope you think about joining us, you, you may. Uh, and I hope you'll come to our next meeting and I'm going to tell you more about that. We have a core curriculum. Uh, you have to have a four-year degree. Your four-year degree can be in horticulture. It could be in business. It could be in a lot of things. Uh, and then we become registered. Uh, you, I gave you our therapeutic garden characteristics. That framework informs all the design work we do at Legacy. And our group is about people and plant connections for health. So, but you are welcome to join our group. You don't have to be a horticulture therapist. So I gave you the therapeutic landscape characteristics. I hope some of you will consider presenting at our 2019 conference. 2018 is already closed. That's going to happen in October. And you would gather then with HTRs like myself uh, and with other healthcare providers and other people like yourself. So come and join us. Um, because garden programs, this is tiny writing when you're way back there, we serve all kinds of health and human service agencies all across America. Um, we have two gardens at Legacy that last year in 2017 we celebrated 20 years of healing, hope, and health. On the left is our children's garden at Legacy Emanuel, and both of these are public gardens. If you're in Portland, just come visit. You don't need to check in or ask. Come and take pictures. And on the right, yeah, I'm going to show you both of these a little more fully. On the right is the uh, Legacy Good Samaritan, the Stenzel Healing Garden. And that was especially designed for rehabilitation. But these are both public gardens, so we really get a terrific return on our investment. Um, I want to focus on the research garden we did with Roger Ulrich as one of our principal investigators. Uh, it's on the second floor, floor right at the Family Birth Center and Cardiovascular ICU called Nature Place, funded by the TKF Foundation, mostly. That was 560000 from them. And that's what that garden looks like now. Second floor, underutilized place, and we turned it into horticulture heaven, 6,500 square feet for patient care. And here's an ICU nurse with her patient out for the first time getting fresh air is critical to life. And here are some of the birth, a birthing mom. They almost have to take a, a number to get the rocking chair. It's so popular. We have two of them. And we care for families. Here's a note. We have a guest book. And somebody wrote, oh, we wanted to thank you. Our mom, came, we came, she came to visit in Portland on vacation. And this happens a lot on vacation. People get hurt. Um, but she uh, broke her neck. She fell and broke her neck. And they wanted to thank us for the gardens and the fantastic professionals. It's really important that we address families and their stress coping. It's hard for everybody. We need to provide privacy. This is all in that second floor ICU family birth garden. And restoration 24-7 year round. We're so lucky to have windows that look out. People can sit on the inside and enjoy if they don't want to go out. I want to show you some plant combinations that I love too. I can never have too many crepe myrtles. Do you call them crepe myrtles here? Yes. Yeah, I noticed that on all your materials you call them Ligerstromia, but I call them crepe myrtles. And I know my botanical Latin, but most people I know, and I teach the patients and the families, it's crepe myrtle. And I do put both botanical and common on the signage. Uh, this is a great abelia. I'm going to test you all. What's this red one? Rara. What's this one? That's a little primrose. I love it that Village Nurseries has annuals on their lists. I'm going to use those when I teach. Uh, we program these gardens for activities. And here's music happening. And one of my interns is leading a garden tour. People are relaxing. And we have more music therapy. Pardon me? I raised a guide dog to the blind. That could have been 
Oh, did up for up in Portland? No. Okay. Okay. But we do have, oh, I can't think of the name of that place out near Sandy that does the guide blog, guide dogs for the blind. Can't think of it. Um, I was in this garden uh, Monday. We had an event and we had music. And I was in another garden yesterday where we were celebrating one year and had music. And so here's one of our dogs coming. More dogs. And I have to tell you, I don't invite the dogs to every garden event. Do you know why? No, they're too popular. <laughs> Everybody would spend all of their time with the dogs. And I want them to be learning about plants more. I don't invite the dogs every time. No. But look at those Bouchons. I'm in love with them. Oh, they make me so happy. All right, so this is a site I was at yesterday. Uh, this was one of our hospitals, and I was around when we built it, but someone forgot to invite the right people to do the planning. So I wasn't involved in this, and it was a bad mess and a waste of money. And you know how hospitals cost a lot of money? This was a really expensive kind of planting, I think. Not, a, not good. Look at this. 90% dormant in the winter. I'll show you some pictures. Yeah, they have they have to be they have to be 365 days, four that's, seasons. That's yeah, but look at this. But this was a mess. This was, oh, I was so embarrassed. All I could do was apologize. Then I was called in after the big mess for years, and we did our three design team meeting process, which is in that book, Therapeutic Landscapes, Chapter Five. We did our three meetings. And our three meetings, and meeting number three, we unveil the concept design. Then we go into fundraising, and we did the fundraising, and then we just dedicated that garden a year ago yesterday. That's why we were celebrating yesterday. That's why I couldn't come earlier, so I got here at like midnight last night. And in part of that dedication a year ago, we invited the a local native tribe to do the blessing for the garden. And this was last summer, and last summer, and I'm amazed at how much progress we can make in a year. But we do, this is 2018, I think this was February when I had some volunteers and we were planting. We plant every month so that we can get that four season garden. I go shopping a lot. I do mega shopping. That's why I like good plant lists. Uh, and here's some of my volunteers two weeks ago. And here's another plant combination from the Village Nursery website. And I'm not going to say them. I know them. What's this one? And honeysuckle is a good word. What's this one? Blue. Looks like bluebeard to me. Caryopterus? Is, that, is this caryopterus, bluebeard? Yeah. Yeah. That one has the name on it. And I love the cypress. And I love Tiny Tower. You'll see it in all of our gardens. All right, uh, Legacy Good Samaritan Medical Center in Northwest Portland. High end, million dollar plus homes. Lovely old neighborhood. This is what we had back in 1996. We did our design team work. And that's the garden on the right. So that we can serve rehabilitation patients. This patient. Uh, had, is a quad amputee, all four extremities amputated, and he had to learn to live again. A patient with balance disorders, a patient with spinal cord injury, learning how to garden from a seated position, and a stroke rehab group, which I have every Tuesday afternoon and every Saturday morning, but I won't have them tomorrow morning. Uh, other rehab therapies use the gardens here is PT and PT and OT working together, and recreational therapy. Uh, on the top right, we do a family patient uh, picnic for Fourth of July, Labor Day, Memorial Day. So the families are doing the kind of things they would do at home. Anybody here a rehab therapist? Some of you are shaking your heads and I think, oh, that must be a rec therapist. They know what I'm talking about. So the gardens are for movement, mild exercise, and we have walking paths uh, and walking maps from all the gardens. Another plant combination. What are these? Yeah, and yes, 
All right, these are plants I love to use and I've been using for years. Uh, we do free garden tours and neighborhood nature walks and especially invite seniors because we want them to be up and active. So I want you to think about stress prevention. That's the biggest thing we can do with these gardens in healthcare because the natural environment can foster well-being and enhance everybody's ability to do their work and be good family members. Employee health, oh, the pets again, the dogs, they just take over. Other kinds of employee health things we do, I think that's called Qi, qi Gong. Do anybody know? Qi Gong, okay. Tai Chi. Uh, I also, the three partners in all of our garden events are employee health, the therapeutic garden program, and sustainability. And I gave you a sustainability handout. It really is important that we take good care of our environment because if we take good care of the environment, we take good care of our people. And here's what a nurse said. She said, I love the gardens and I find relaxation in them. And she worked for 55 years the night shift. Uh, we've developed walking programs at every hospital. I gave you our nature and good health benefits and our medical director for employee health. We use this handout with our 14,000 employees. So I challenge you to kind of see if you can write some for the employee work settings where you are. We have a passport to good health for employees. And this is, I'm going to buzz through these employee wellness activities that we conduct in the garden. So here we're handing out the passports. And when I look at the pictures, I see happy employees. Happy employees provide better care. And we don't have such turnover. And Mark was right. Turnover is about... 100 to 200 percent of the employee wage. So I'm just going to buzz through these events. Look at these happy nurses. Midnight in the garden, it's on August 22nd, coming up. Uh, and that night we always do white flower study. So I go buy a whole bunch of white flowers and we set them up. They're lined up there and then people can take home a white flower list to plant in their garden. Uh, we want our people to get outdoors every, uh, every day, but we have special events like a meal outside, a picnic. On Tuesdays, we have music at some of the gardens. So the garden is a stress coping resource for our employees. We created a public park on our property. It was an underutilized declining space for many years, as long as I'd been there. Uh, we invested quarter of a million dollars and dedicated that and we're getting ready to celebrate a first anniversary there. We have community partners, lots of community engagement, volunteers come, people come to participate in, if we have an activity in the garden, it's a public activity. And our farm stands to promote healthy eating, we try to have these farm stands in gardens where we can, where we have enough space. Yes, did you have a question? Okay. Uh, I have 20 to 26 volunteers, usually uh, the top person, I, you know, my older volunteers, and I don't get down in, on my knees because I want to save my knees so I can walk in my 80s, 90s, and 100s, and I absolutely don't want a knee surgery or a hip surgery if I can avoid it. So I teach people how to stand and use a winged weeder. Deadheading is a big one, giving garden tours, sweeping, we sweep every day. And we have volunteers year round. Your shift is four hours every week of your life. We know you go on vacation, you have to sign up for those. I have paid gardeners for weekly maintenance at least twice in every garden. Don't build it if you can't take care of it. Uh, horticulture therapy, I work with patients who have clinical goals. I know how to use plant material. And horticulture therapy is a treatment. That's just a graphic of horticulture therapy is that star in the middle. And these are some of the activities I've done with horticulture therapy and long-term care nursing home. We developed the Portland Memory Garden and Mark and the ASLA worked on this to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the ASLA back in 1999. It took us until 92, we opened it in 92, we had to raise $750,000. It's at Ed Benedict Park, that's public, you can go there too. Another plant combination, let's keep moving. We do senior gardening days at Portland Nursery. These are my interns that conduct these activities. And we do Apple Fest in October at Portland Nurseries. We've been doing that since 2004. Buzz through the children's garden. We built that in 1997. 
It's public. Come and take pictures anytime. And the nurses call it the heart of the hospital. We have pediatric nature stations on Wednesday afternoon. I was, do I was doing that Wednesday with interns. When it's too hot, too cold, too windy, we're in the hallway overlooking the garden for nature stations. And we also, we have a theme every month. In February, it's Hawaiian days. So we study tropical plants every Wednesday afternoon. More plant combinations, you know your plants going on. The burn center garden, that's after we had deconstructed everything and ready to go. And we turned it into that in 2004. Um, we do burn concern support group there. And that this night, we're making hanging baskets. More plant combinations that I love. New design team meeting. We're building a new burn center garden on the fifth floor in a new surgery tower. A behavioral health garden that we outlived. We just opened a new Unity Hospital behavioral health garden, 20,000 square feet in two gardens. Our Mount Hood Medical Center. Fundraising took us three years. Uh, Dr. Brown, my CEO, did the groundbreaking. I knew he was a gastroenterologist, and he always said he likes to take apart tractors and put them back together. He has three. So I thought, well, he must know how to drive them if he can take them apart. And he said, oh, sure, I can do that. So he did the first scoop. <laughs> and community engagement, construction. I'm just going to buzz through Meridian Park Hospital. That terrace garden, we had a planning grant for $14,000. We did our design team work. That's what it looked like before. We did that design work with our $560,000. The construction was two hundred and forty-three, and we the research studies cost money, over three hundred thousand. Uh, we studied birthing moms. We studied fam families under high stress. We fancy families, moms. Oh, we studied nurses in a double blind study using the garden for a break, not using the garden, and then switching. And then we did a user study. And there's a picture of Roger Ulrich at the bottom in the blue shirt. He came to Portland during that three year time at least eight times to help us. And we had at least 25 different meetings. So, construction on that second floor. We were building in March and we had snow in 2014. We built a new overlook deck and uh, secured that to add more space. We secured it to the first floor. I have to tell you this one. We had to get to the interior of the hospital. So it was lightweight soil mix. It just happened that that first floor was vacant, no patients in there. We were changing to another population. We took out a window, put the pipe through, went through the hallway, out the other window, uh, the other room across the hall, through the children's garden, up to the second floor to put in the soil mix. Oh, wow. that was something. More plant combinations. I, I could talk about plants all day. So programming the garden, you can see some of the activities that we program for, for families. Music in the treetops. And it is a stress coping resource for families because prolonged stress weakens our immune system. It strains our heart. Even one day of stress, an hour of stress. It damages memory cells in our brains. And lots of stress causes fat to uh, hang on around our waist instead of usually uh, like get fat, it, hang, it settles around our hips. So fat around our waist is not good uh, for heart disease, cancer, and other illnesses. Job stress, this one shocked me when I was studying stress. Job stress is the source of more health, complaint, health complaints than financial or family problems. Whoa, we should be so grateful if we work in a place where we love our work and love our colleagues. And if a garden can help, we need more gardens. And like Mark was saying, replacing an average employee is 100 to 200 percent of their salary. So a $90,000 ICU nurse is really close to 200,000. So I think there are some key messages we want to get out. 
all of us need to be reminding ourselves and our families and the people we serve to get out even more for health and well-being. We want you to feel good. So get out into nature every day. And that further away nature, try to go monthly or yearly. So I think our marketing people can help in all workplaces about how to communicate the health benefits of nature. So here are some resources, the American Public Health Association. And they, talk, they have a policy statement on nature, health, and wellness. I think every horticulturalist should know this. J. Frank Schmidt, my neighbors, uh, their stock av availability, they often put stories of our gardens on the cover. This one's about Dr. Ulrich, and then one of the, my favorite trees I use, Cornus controversa. I love June Snow Dogwood. The Oregon Association of Nurseries Plant Something. They uh, published some research here and using one of our garden pictures. I belong to the National Initiative for Consumer Horticulture, and our mission is growing a healthy world through plants, gardens, and landscapes. Um, and we're developing more uh, marketing materials like this. This is about what plants do on the inside. We're working on what plants do outdoors. So I have my top 10 things that I want in a therapeutic garden, and I gave you that handout, so I'm not going to go through them now because I really would get on my soapbox. But I want places where people feel comfortable and they're in great beauty and great nature, and where they can buy their local organic produce. Um, and I'd like to suggest that you might want to get better and better and better at this by developing four season planning. If you take each season, put the months, and then make, and I meant to print this for you and I forgot, but then put trees, shrubs, perennials, and annuals across, and check, just check out how your garden is doing now. And then it will also help when you're planning a new garden too, and do this for each season. And then uh, four season planning for therapeutics, the therapeutic of visual, what's, what's really impactful visually, what's impactful as far as sound and auditory, what's impactful as far as touch and tactile, and smell would be the olfactory, olfactory, and taste would be gustatory. So I think of all those things with every piece of plant material that I buy. So health and nature is so important. These are patients in the hospital. The woman in that top picture is pulling her oxygen tank, and she's stuck at the hospital. The man at the bottom uh, has his son visiting with him on a March day, so they put on a blanket and went outside. Um, that's their nearby nature. So many of us can go 20 miles. This is uh, uh, Crown Point, 20 miles from Portland. But hospital patients can't get there, so we need to bring the, nat the nature to them. You have a couple great resources right here, right in this area. California Relief, I suggest working with them. They are also on that National Consumer Horticulture Initiative. They're really strong players. Uh, we just need to encourage all the tree people to remember shrubs, perennials, annuals, and vines, too. Uh, and then your Coastal Conservancy works on uh, environmentally sustainable landscapes. So we need to increase action around health and nature, the nature sacred. They funded us that TKF Foundation for the research. Uh, Mark talked about therapeutic landscapes. Uh, Green Cities, Good Health, that's University of Washington my professional group, AHTA. We have the Intertwine Alliance in Portland has done a great job. And then the USDA, US Forest Service, great partners. I would like to invite you, email me if you're interested. We're doing a Gardens in Healthcare conference on Saturday, September 15th. And then September 16th, I'll be giving guided tours on a bus of all of our legacy gardens. So just email me if you're interested. We're just finalizing that registration. And thank you so much. I hate to be between you and the liquor. Thank you.